Um, what we're going to talk about today is we've got some background slides and the slides talk about the problem definition that we're going to tackle today as well as a quick overview of what Adam's car is, an overview of Maple Sim, um, the FMI standard that we're going to use to integrate the two um, tools together. And then Blake is going to run through a demonstration of the process and finally we'll end with questions and discussion so as Hamont mentioned um, please do um, type in any questions that you have type those into the q a panel so to get started um, let's talk a little bit about the problem that we're looking at today and i've got a, a vehicle this is a virtual car um, and yes it's missing the graphics for the shell but it has proper mass properties I've got all the proper connections here. This is a fairly detailed model of a virtual vehicle, and it's doing a fairly simple event. It's just driving straight down a road. And in particular, what it's doing is it's accelerating. You can see that from the chassis velocity plot. Starts out at only 10 kilometers an hour, and then the driver gets on the accelerator or the throttle and um, gives it some throttle and holds the throttle steady. You can see the velocity response as the vehicle moves forward. And a couple of interesting things here is that this is supposed to be a slippery surface. So perhaps it's a road covered with some snow. And I'll show that in a little bit more depth in, in just a moment. And um, a designer or an engineer might do this kind of event. And you might be interested in, well, you know, does the car <laughs> accelerate down the road? What's the velocity profile look like? But perhaps more interestingly, um, when it um, accelerates down the road, does the vehicle um, squat and dive? How does it behave as you vary the throttle input? Um, does it does the vehicle pitch forward and back? And how much does it do that? If so, um, is it symmetric side to side, left to right? There's many many parameters that you can um, study in this virtual model. So um, I'm just going to show how you would actually run this in an Adams car simulation to get started and start generating some results and take a look at the kinds of things that we're gonna look at today. So in the Adams car interface, if I wanted to actually run that vehicle on a slippery road, I would do what's called a, an acceleration event. And so this is um, a predefined event. Um, as you could see in the previous video, it, it's quite straightforward. Um, I need to specify a road property file. And in this case, I've specified a road that has um, a lower mu value. So it's a slippery road, um, assuming that, you know, the road's covered in snow, for example. And the vehicle starts from 11 kilometers an hour. And at a start time of one second, we're going to take the throttle or the accelerator and we're going to increase it from zero, which is initial coast, up to 70% of uh, full throttle. And we're going to do that in a duration of one second. So between the time of one and two seconds simulation time, we're going to increase that throttle from zero to 70%. So um, if we do that, there's many outputs that we can study on the vehicle. This is one of the typical time histories that we can take a look at. This is the, the slip rate for the front wheels. Now this is a rear wheel drive car. So I'm going to talk about rear wheel drive versus um, the front wheels in just a moment. But um, if you take a look at the front wheels, initially there's some slippage going on, um, which is to be expected. The front wheels are just rolling along. And at a time of one second, we hit the throttle and we start increasing the throttle from zero up to 70% through this time span between one and two seconds. So between one and two seconds, we're increasing the throttle. And so the rear wheels are pushing the car forward, and you can see that the front wheels, um, they start to change the, the slip rate. Um, happens, and some more things happen here, and then finally we get into a steady state, and as the car's um, accelerating forward um, through the rest of the simulation. So that's the slip rate of the front wheels. Um, you might ask yourself, well, wait a minute, this is a, a rear wheel drive car. Why are you looking at the slip rate of the front wheels. Well, if we plot the um, slip rate of the rear wheels versus the slip rate of the front wheels, you can see the blue curve is the, the rear wheels. And you can see what happens at 1.7 seconds approximately. And what happens is that the wheels start to um, spin excessively, the rear wheels. So the amount of torque that we apply to those rear wheels um, becomes so much that it um, overcomes the coefficient of friction for that surface, our rear wheels start, uh, break free and start to spin. 
And that's, as everyone knows, that's probably undesirable. Um, at this point, if you were driving in a, in a winter scenario, uh, as a driver, you should let off on the throttle. You, could, you should let off gently on the throttle and uh, hopefully get these rear wheels under control. Um, since this is a virtual model, it's fairly easy to, um, to do some studies and say, look, um, if this is instead of a rear wheel drive car, how would um, a four wheel drive car behave in that same scenario? So in Adam's car, it's fairly easy to create parameter variables and adjust them. In this particular model, we've got a parameter variable called uh, drive torque bias to the front. So in the previous scenario, I had set this parameter to be, to be zero, which means that all the torque goes to the rear wheels. If I set it to be 0 0.5, that's gonna split the torque that's developed by the engine, and we're gonna split the torque so that it equally goes to the front and to the rear. So it's split equally between front and rear. You can imagine in these days when um, advanced vehicles have more electric motors in them, you can place electric motors, uh, perhaps one in the front, one in the rear, and it's easy to accomplish, um, easier to accomplish things like this than it has been in the past when you have a mechanical um, drive line with um, clutches that slip and um, viscous couplings and that kind of thing. So um, in this particular model, um, if I make this change, and it's my virtual model, so I can make the change really quickly. I can go back and rerun the event, and now I get some um, wheel slip rates that look a lot better than previous. So my wheels are still slipping, which is to be expected, um, but the, the magnitude of the slip is significantly lower than what it shown previously. And it doesn't look to me like um, these wheels are, are um, breaking free. And so um, I think this result shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's familiar with um, front wheel drive or real, rear wheel drive versus um, four wheel drive vehicles. Because what we've done is we've taken the torque that, from the engine that we've developed and we've only applied half of that torque to those the same rear wheels that were spinning previously. And then we've taken the other portion of the torque and we've put it to the front wheels. So we've, we've halved the amount of torque to the wheels that were spinning previously and we've doubled the number of wheels that can provide traction forces. So these wheels probably aren't slipping very much, and this vehicle is going to um, accelerate faster, and it's gonna be under control because there's no, um, there's no wheels slipping around. You might ask yourself the question, hey, wait a minute, why is there a different slip in the front wheels versus the rear wheels? And this is um, likely due to weight distribution in the vehicle. So um, it's fairly easy in atoms. I could have plotted the, um, the normal forces in the car and in the wheels. And um, for this particular vehicle, I have more weight on the rear wheels than on the front wheels. Um, as well, when you do an acceleration event, there's um, a weight transfer naturally as the vehicle, um, there's a weight transfer to the rear, it's called squat, and um, that naturally happens, so typically your rear wheels um, get weighted more during an acceleration event. Um, note that for this particular event, I have um, specified the torque distribution is 50% front, 50% rear. What if I could vary that dynamically? And that's what that's where torque vectoring comes in. Um, if you can take that torque that you're developing from your, your motor or motors, and you can put it in different proportions to the front and to the rear, or even left and right, you can influence the dynamic behavior of this, this vehicle in, in hopefully positive ways. <laughs> so um, we're gonna talk now, um, that's the problem that we're gonna take a look at. And Blake is going to do a demonstration of how we're going to hook up this previous vehicle to um, um, a control system in MapleSim. And he's going to investigate how we can change parameters and influence the, the two systems. Before we do that, though, just a brief overview for of Adam's car and of MapleSim. So Adam's car, for those of you that are not aware, is um, it's the de facto standard in the industry for um, vehicle dynamic simulations. And many engineers work in this area right here, this area of handling. And so you um, 
develop a fairly detailed system. You could have a, a simple system or a medium complexity system or a detailed system of vehicle with all of the suspension components, all the masses, um, steering system. And what you're interested in, what people are primarily interested in, are handling characteristics. So when you run this virtual model through um, a bunch of virtual tests, how does the vehicle handle as it uh, maneuvers through things? That's where people spend a lot of their time. Once you get this nailed down, then you might start taking a look at um, the ride of the vehicle. So as you've got road disturbances that are applied to this vehicle, or you hit potholes and, and that's a road disturbance, how does the feel for the occupant. So is the, does the acceleration of the seat, um, how does that feel on the occupant? What's the feel of the steering wheel when um, the wheels are getting um, bumped around by road disturbances? And then NVH is noise, vibration, and harshness. So uh, once you get the handling stuff um, tuned in, you might take a look at NVH and ride. And then finally, you might um, eventually get over here to durability and you ask the question, um, have I properly sized some of these components in here? So this is, um, this is a finite element model of um, a part in the suspension system. In order to properly analyze this, um, this individual part in the system, you need very accurate loads. And that's what Atoms will do. Atoms will pro provide very accurate loads um, on into this piece. Once you've got very accurate loads, then you can take that to your uh, finite element package and you can do stress and strain analyses and eventually uh, durability analyses. But you can't do any of that if you don't have accurate loads. Um, as well, there's many other um, options in here that you can use to study Atoms and people People use atoms to study all different aspects of their vehicle um, uh, systems. This is um, the latest one on the horizon is autonomous. Um, many of these autonomous um, offerings that are online have a vehicle model built into them. And you can imagine that the, um, the quality of the predictions in the vehicle model are probably largely dependent on the quality of the initial model that you created. So um, we've got a product where it's fairly easy to take your um, detailed atoms model and refine it down to a real-time model that can be used in these um, autonomous um, simulations and uh, real-time um, predictors. So um, in a little bit more detail, what do you do in Adam's car? Well, as an engineer, you would build all these components. You'd make parts that are properly connected to other parts. Um, they have to have the proper masses and inertias. They all, they all have to be physically um, relevant and physically, physically meaningful. There's connections. There's um, detailed bushing connections that are required. Um, you can have forces that are linear or nonlinear. You can have frequency dependent um, bushings and dampers. You can build all sorts of com complexity into this little um, front suspension system, for example. And maybe as a first pass, your engine is just a simple block with proper mass properties and maybe a few mounting points. Um, our tire models can go can range from um, complex to very, very, very complex. And um, similarly for all, all these other systems. And what Adam's car does is it takes these subsystems and it will all properly merge them all into um, an assembly, a vehicle assembly. So this is your vehicle model. And it's easy for you to um, define and maintain libraries of models or, or vehicle assemblies. Once you've got your model, then you want to exercise it somehow. And this is an actual um, a physical, this is a virtual um, model of an actual physical test machine. And so you can see that the, the wheels are getting exercised up and down in, in a prescribed pattern. And then maybe you're measuring um, accelerations or displacements somewhere on, on the um, elsewhere in the body. So this is one of the test rigs that we can use to exercise an arbitrary model that you've defined. Another test rig that's more commonly used is this um, standard driver interface. And the standard driver interface that we have, it knows how to take your model and exercise your model through all sorts of different events. So there's safety events, steering feel events, limit handling, maneuvering. So maneuvering might be a single lane change. Or it might be, um, in this case, this is called, I think this is a, a constant radius cornering event. So this large truck 
is exercised by this um, standard driver interface and the steering is controlled in the truck so that, such that the truck is going around a constant radius corner, so a, a very large corner. And you modulate the throttle, you increase the throttle, and you see how fast this truck can go around this corner with a constant radius. And at some point, you've got some lateral acceleration, and uh, at some point, the um, the normal forces on the inside versus the outside tires, you can imagine that um, the, the truck is going to want to tip over at some point if you go too fast. And this virtual test is um, very similar or analogous to skid pad results that you might see um, if you open up a car magazine and you look at um, you know how many G's can this vehicle pull on a skid pad. Um, this is the virtual test that that um, relates to the actual physical test that's done when the car is finally created in, in real life. So the standard driver interface lets you do all sorts of events um, in Adam's car. And then finally, for every event that you do, for this, um, this constant radius cornering event, for example, you, there's a report. And a report might consist of 10 or 12 pages of plots and a numeric report, and that's only for the constant radius cornering event. You can imagine for the single lane change event, there's a similar report. Um, for the braking ev um, event, for the acceleration event, all these different events, there's, there's a different report. Um, so that's Adam's car. Um, for MapleSim, I'll let Blake um, describe this. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. So what is MapleSim? Very top level. Uh, it's a, an advanced system level modeling tool can handle multi-domain models. Um, doesn't have to be multi-domain, but it can handle it. So there are really kind of three big uh, aspects that we like to always talk about. The first is MapleSim. This is the actual modeling and simulation tool. This is what we're really going to be working with uh, a lot today, what we're going to see in the demonstration. On top of MapleSim, we also have Maple. Uh, so Maple, many of you might know this. This is our flagship product. Um, it's essentially a symbolic mathematics tool. Uh, it could be used for design space exploration, optimization, and the way we're going to see it in today's demo is actually using it as a user interface that we've programmed, coded, and designed for a specific application. And then the final step in this chain is MapleSim Connector. So MapleSim Connector for us is re really just different ways of being able to um, export the model so that you can bring it into other tools whether this is with, um, say, an FMI standard, which is what we're going to see today, or just exporting plain C code. Um, just to talk a bit more, so there is, so within MapleSim, we, so this is an example of a multi-domain model, very simple um, kind of car model, so nothing as elaborate as you would get in, say, uh, MSC Atoms. Um, however, this is just to show that we can do things such as um, you put in your control system, and you also have your mechanical components, which are going to be your motor. Maybe you have some batteries. Maybe this is a hybrid vehicle, so you have your chemical and electrical components, thermal for your cooling system. And you can combine all of these within MapleSim. Um, and kind of one, one of the ways that engineers might use this is you can develop points, uh, different components one at a time and then connect them all together, see how everything performs as a whole. And then once you have everything built, do some kind of design exploration, maybe start tuning things using Maple to do an optimal design analysis. Um, on the top here, you can see just a very simple example of trying to figure out um, what is a good, you know, we have on one end the optimum fuel consumption, minim like minimizing that, and on the other end you have the optimum for power loss, so maybe we meet somewhere in the middle. These are the kind of analyses you could do once you have your Maple Sim model built. Um, the other tool that we have uh, that is also an MapleSim as an add-on to is Maple. So we can use Maple for doing various types of analyses. So for example, a dynamic load analysis, a parameter sweep or optimization. So being able to run through multiple simulations rather quickly. Vibration analysis, if we're interested in seeing the frequency response or just um, you know, which frequencies we might need to be worried about as our system is, is performing its action. And we can do inverse kinematics and dynamics. So again, using uh, the symbolic nature of Maple, we can actually solve some of these problems uh, symbolically. And then finally, we can go into, say, motor sizing. So this could be maybe for um, automation or just any kind of motor that you're using. 
maybe you know what your, your, your motor profile is, you run a test, you can see what are the torque requirements versus your, um, say your RPM, and, and see whether or not the motor you've selected is going to be an appropriate size. So this is really just a very quick overview of Maple, Maple Sim. Um, I'll be able to highlight a lot more of these things once we jump into the demonstration. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass it back to Kent so that we can just um, finish up some of these intro slides before we jump into the uh, demo part. Thanks, Blake. Um, so I wanted to talk about why we're building a, a high fidelity combined system. And when you're in the atoms world, it's certainly possible to to put um, control system blocks into your model. So you can put PID controllers, you can put um, lags, transfer functions, and we actually have um, blocks that you can use to put those in. And um, so it's fairly easy to bake those into your atoms model. Um, if you don't like that, we can also do um, user subroutines that are in Fortran or C. Those can get baked into your model as well. Um, you can build differential equations or systems of differential equations. Um, and you can come up with a very high fidelity system in Atoms. But at some point, um, Atoms is fairly easy to build the multi-body dynamics model, but at some point, all of this other stuff that you're putting on top, it gets to be a bit much, and you might hit a limit with the complexity. So it's certainly possible to build all the complexity into here, but um, you might start running into limits at some point. And um, same thing for MapleSim. You can build all sorts of um, different components. And if you think that this component here needs more fidelity, well, you can roll up your sleeves and go and build a, a better version of that component and stick it into your system level diagram. And at some point, you have to ask yourself, well, am I using my, the tool that I need? Am I using the proper tool for the, for the proper job? And in this demonstration, we're going to be using Adam's car to model the high fidelity vehicle model. And we're going to be using MapleSim to do a bunch of um, system level control that's um, it's perfect to do in here. So MapleSim can solve this problem very well. Adam's car can solve this problem really well. If we just had a way to stick them together and make them work properly, then um, it would be great. And for this, we're going to use the um, FMI interface. So just a quick overview of this. Um, I've actually pulled this straight off of the FMI website. So <laughs> if you go to the FMI website and it looks familiar, that's because this is um, what it is. But this blurb here I thought was very important. It's a tool independent standard that supports both model exchange and co-simulation of dynamic models. And it uses a combination of XML files and compiled C code. What I'm going to focus on here is that it's a it's um, a standard to support co-simulation of dynamic models. So we've got a dynamic model in Atoms and a very dynamic model in MapleSim. And we're going to use FMI to hook these two pieces together. And again, we're going to focus on the co-simulation mode. There's a, a mode called model exchange where you export the equations from one package to another. And then one package tries to solve all the, um, all the equations at once. Um, we're going to focus on the mode where Adam solves the Adam's problem and MapleSim solves the MapleSim problem. So that's called co-simulation. It tends to be more robust and it's, it's a good place to start. That's where you should start. Um, so, a little bit more detail uh, in the demonstration, Blake is going to create um, this, this Atoms um, FMU block, so the functional mock-up unit, and he's going to create that from Atoms car. And the FMI standard is going to manage how that Atoms block, if you take that Atoms thing and you, you import the FMU into MapleSim, um, the first thing that F the FMI standard manages is how Atoms is started on your system in the background and how this model gets loaded into the system. So we're going to do a co-simulation between the two packages. That means that MapleSim is going to run and Atoms is going to run at the same time in the background. And so the FMI um, system manages how Atoms get started up and how the model gets loaded. The next thing is it manages um, what are the parameters that the Atoms model, um, you can alter in the Atoms model. So maybe here's some parameters that you would see in Atoms. Uh, MapleSim can um, change these parameters 
uh, once at the start of the simulation. These are not dynamic parameters. These are just um, parameter variables or design variables. These are the things that would get changed at the start of the co-simulation, and then they're held fixed through, through the co-simulation. So that's one other thing that it does. Um, the FMI standard, most importantly, um, determines what the inputs and outputs are to the system. So Atoms expects that you're putting forces and torques into Atoms. So we're going to compute some forces and torques or some signals in MapleSim. And again, Atoms is looking to get forces or torques in. And then Atoms will solve its um, uh, system and it will produce um, typically kinematics or other states back to uh, MapleSim. So it'll provide uh, displacements, velocities, accelerations, or any other computed state or, or forces. Um, anything you want can go out of atoms. It's just that we expect uh, forces and torques to be coming into atoms. And finally, the FMI standard manages how these two tools co-simulate with respect to one another. And at a very high level, what happens is um, there's, it's a discrete co-simulation where MapleSim takes um, a very small time step and then it computes some results and it sends them to Atoms. At that same time, Atoms has taken the same small time step, it's computed some results and it um, sends back the, the states back to MapleSim. And so it's a sample and hold scheme for the states that are coming in and out and it's a discrete co-simulation in that um, it's a, a a number of very small discrete simulations that stop exchange data, start the simulation, and then stop exchange data, start the simulation, stop exchange data. So each package is simulating independently of one another, but at discrete intervals they're get, getting these updates um, applied to them. So that's, um, that's managed by the FMI um, interface. So with that, um, I'll stop talking and Blake um, is going to do the demonstration. Excellent. Thanks, Ken. So I'm just going to take presenter mode and share my screen. All right. What I have in front of us, this is MapleSim when you open it up. The middle here is the canvas. This is where we build our models. The left are various libraries that we have available to us. So again, you can see the multi-domain nature of MapleSim, electrical, 1D mechanical, multi-body, hydraulics, thermal, all these various domains. And on the right is an area where we can define properties, uh, simulation settings, et cetera. So in this already um, kind of worked model, I can see that I have a controller that I've created. I've coded this in myself. Um, there are tools within MapleSim that can help you generate these components or these custom components based on equations. You can also code it in yourself using the Medelica language, which is what MapleSim uses um, as its language. And at this point, I'm just going to import the FMU that I've had created for me from. So this is an FMU that's been created using Atoms. I'm going to browse. So we can see it, it knows that it's a co-simulation. This is the uh, export option that was selected. It gives me some information about uh, this FMU. And then here, the synchronization time. Uh, this is what Ken was talking about. This is going to be that kind of step size, that communication interval that we use uh, to kind of talk between the two softwares. So I'm going to hit OK. And this is going to load the FMU and add it into my model. So now in these uh, local components, I can drag and drop this component. And now I have my FMU. So Inside of Atoms, you can define what are going to be your inputs and outputs. In this case, my input is this torque front percent. So that ratio or that percentage that Kent was talking about, about how much of the torque is going from the rear wheels to the front wheels. So again, having a zero value for this front torque, the torque front percent would mean it's completely rear wheel drive. And then on the right hand side, we have output. So these are measurements that we've um, Told atoms that we want to be able to make these measurements. Some of these are, for example, the, uh, let me turn on the display here. Right, so we have tire forces down here, the distance traveled, different wheel speed, uh, the yaw rate. So, and again, you can put whatever might be of interest, whatever you, you care about in your, in your simulation. So in MapleSim, to connect my components, I'm just going to click and click to connect. So 
in my controller, it's going to output the ratio. So this is going to be that um, kind of distribution of the torque from the rear to the front. And then the input to my controller is going to be the different wheel speeds. So what this controller is going to be doing is looking at the difference in the wheel speeds from the front to the rear. And based on the different uh, wheel speeds, it's going to apply a certain ratio. So it's going to dynamically change the, um, the ratio of torque that's being given from the rear to the front. So as the difference in the wheel speeds increases, it's actually going to it's going to apply or send more torque to the front wheels. So again, I can hover over here and I see my controller wants the FL, so the front left. Connect it, and I can do this with all my various connections. The other option that I have in MapleSim is I can actually uh, define or add probes to my system. So probes allow me to generate plots within MapleSim. So once I run a simulation, anything that I've probed, I will get a plot for. So I just simply add this to ports or connection lines, and then I can give it a name, for example, longitudinal velocity. The other option, so going back to the design parameters that you might want to change at the start of a simulation, if I click on the FMU block, I get all of these various settings. So some of these are going to be regarding the, the solver, um, maybe the grid size, the sample size, all these things. And if I scroll down, I'm going to find these design parameters that uh, might be of interest to change. So for example, I have my chassis mass. So maybe I want to parameterize this, so I'm going to give it a name. Then I also have, maybe I'm interested in changing my trim mass. The reason I'm giving these names is to make this a parameter that I can change uh, programmatically within MapleSim. On the top left here, I have a parameter block. And we can see that I have the chassis mass and trim mass already defined. And I also have this max ratio, max diff. These are going into my controller to kind of uh, give limits to my controller. So I don't want to be able to give, say, for example, um, send all the torque to the front wheel. Maybe I want to cap it at 50-50. Uh, so that, that's, these are parameters I'm going to be able to tune um, and, and play with. So I'm just going to go to this completed model. I've already added all the probes here. Uh, and I'm actually just going to click this play button and run a simulation. What you can see in this console output, um, there are a couple of things happening. So first, the, uh, the engine is looking at all the components I have on the screen. And it's getting all the equations, and then it's using Maple to symbolically reduce the number of equations, optimize, and really allow for the most efficient set of equations uh, that we could solve. This makes our simulation and integration a bit faster. What we see right now is it's initializing. It's starting the integration phase. And what's actually happening behind the scenes is because we have this Atoms FMU, it's actually loading Atoms up. So it's, it's booting up Atoms. As Kent mentioned, because it's a co-simulation, we're using Atoms to solve the Atoms problem, MapleSim to solve the MapleSim problem. So it needs to load up Atoms first, and, and once it's loaded, then it's going to be able to run the simulation. So I'm just going to, I have had this open for quite a while, so I'm actually just going to close these. Um, Again, we are still working on uh, just some of the kind of getting the FMUs to work together. Uh, so when I have my MapleSim open on this remote desktop for a long time, it seems to have uh, um, it won't always. It, it seems to just kind of take a step, and then it, it seems to not to forget how to communicate. So again, this is still just a proof of concept. So we are going to be working on all of these issues. So I'm just going to open up that completed model again. I'll hit run once again. So again, at this point, we see that it's, it's, it's loading up atoms. It's going to make that uh, basically initialization uh, so that things can get uh, simulated. And once, we, once the simulation starts, you're going to see it's taking that 0 0.01 time step, and it's doing, as Kent mentioned, that uh, kind of simulated hold. So it's going to have almost like a, a step look 
tracking pattern because it's basically doing 0 0.01 seconds, waiting, and then moving along. But it's going to show me um, the values in between. So what we have here is our controller actually interacting with the Adams FMU, so that full-fledged Adams car model. And we're actually giving it some kind of variable uh, input. So we can see here the ratio. So this ratio, this is for my controller. I can see that for these values, I've capped it at 0 0.01. At some point, my wheel speeds are different enough that it's actually going to turn on the controller and just hold it at this value. But we can see that it is dynamically changing throughout the simulation. So this covers kind of the maple sim part, kind of really just bringing in the FMU, doing a, simple sim a single simulation and seeing the results. The next part I want to talk about is really using maple so that you can um, kind of make the design process a bit more fluid, a bit more intuitive. Um, maple allows you to essentially develop your own user interface with, and using the maple programming language to um, add function calls and create code so that it performs certain actions. I'm going to go to my apps and templates, and I've created this Adams Car Controller Design app as a mock-up of what could be done with, you know, using both tools and what can be done in Maple. So I've already done multiple simulations, so I'm just going to load that data. So in this model, I already have some da some data that's been saved. I'm just going to double-click to load it. I'm going to go through the various sections of this app. So in the first one, we have this controller design. So again, this is just a very simple controller uh, model. Of course, we can make this much more complicated. Right now, it looks at the speed percent difference between the front and the rear tires, and based on that, we'll change the front torque ratio. From this app, I'm also able to change the FMU parameters. So in this case, I only cared about the chassis mass and the trim mass. I could add more, I could add less. Um, and just by changing the values here, I'll be able to run a simulation with those different parameters. And then the part that we really care about is going to the simulation results. So as you can see, I've saved five simulations, and I can cycle through them and see the different results. Uh, so in this first one, I made my max ratio zero. So essentially, this is the case of no controller. So I just tell it to go down the road and just you know do, do whatever you're going to do. For each of the probes I added in the MapleSim model, I can now see the results here. This is the ratio, so we see it was off the entire time, so there's no controller. Steering wheel angle, the various tire forces, the wheel speeds. So we can see that for the front wheels, they're quite, um, you know, relatively low, especially compared to the rear wheels. And then I also have plots that show me, say, all four tire, all four of the forces on the tires at once, as well as all four of the wheel speeds at once. I can cycle through my various simulations. I can see as I turn on the controller, my wheel speeds are getting a bit closer together. Again, in this case, I've made my maximum ratio, so how much of that torque I'm sending to the front go from 0 to 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. And we can see that the values for the uh, wheel speeds are getting closer together. And then I played around with certain things, such as um, when I turn it on or when I hit the maximum, say, at 4% difference between the wheel speeds. Increasing the chassis mass, I see now my controller is kind of, it, it's working a bit harder. It's making my, uh, my wheel speeds kind of jump around. So this is how uh, you can kind of investigate these, these different aspects. You run your simulations, you can compare them. We can also do side-by-side -side comparisons. If I just use control and click, I can select multiple results. Um, so I can go through and, and kind of see how various uh, controller schemes are going to compare to one another. Um, and maybe just of this, so maybe I'll just build another so a simple one. I'll, so I'll make my maximum front torque ratio 0 0.45, maximum speed difference 4. Um, maybe I'll change some of these parameters. And I'm going to hit the simulate button. So again, what we really want to highlight in this webinar is um, not necessarily that MapleSim is purely or strictly a control tool. Uh, but that this was a nice application to really show that connectivity between the two softwares. Um, you know, we could really add, you, we can go the extra mile, kind of add extra, uh, a lot more, really utilize the multi-domain nature of MapleSim. Uh, think of more complex uh, 
schemes, maybe more complex controllers, adding more dynamics. Uh, one of the strengths of MapleSim is um, it, it's multi-body and capturing the physics of problems. So when you're using when you're using MapleSim, you're really getting a, a high fidelity physics-based model, um, and, and this could be advantageous for really investigating um, you know, kind of other areas other than just focusing on, say, the, the car aspect. So I can see my simulation is done. It's added the results for me, automatically plots them, um, and just gives me, a, again, a nice tool to really visualize the results. The last step here is essentially updating my MapleSim model. So I can, maybe I'm happy with the last model that I, or the last controller setup that I had. I click on the load recent controller parameters, so it automatically brings them for me. I click the update MapleSim. So what it's doing is, actually going back to my MapleSim model, and in that parameter block, it's going to update these values automatically for me. And then the final step is maybe I've designed some elaborate controller or I've, I've designed some kind of system that I want to work in tandem with the Atoms car FMU, but now I want to go back into Atoms because maybe I want to tweak some of my, um, my car parameters or maybe I want to run different events in Atoms. So I can go to my apps and templates, go to the FMI connector, I'll open up this FMU generation app. I can select my controller. So this is, can, this is telling it that this is the only part I care about exporting in my FMU. Once it loads, I can see my inputs are going to be those four wheel speeds. The output is going to be the controller ratio. My parameters, I'm going to have this max diff and max ratio. I have the option of keeping it fixed or tunable. So fixed is the idea that you can change the value before a simulation, but once the simulation starts, you're stuck or fixed with that value, whereas tunable would mean that I could actually change this maximum ratio throughout the simulation. Under the export options, we see that uh, MapleSim supports both 1.0, 2.0, as well as model exchange and CoSim. Um, as Ken mentioned, we really do care about the co-simulation at this point. I can choose the solver that I want to embed in my FMU so, so that when uh, the FMU is being run, which solver am I in, is going to be used. Um, one of the neat things about the MapleSim FMUs is that we do actually embed our solvers within it. So you can actually bring these FMUs to systems that don't necessarily have MapleSim installed, and, you'll still, and you'd be able to run the, the FMU as well. So I'll click on the match simulation settings. It's going to load up that communication step size for me automatically. Select the desktop. Make sure I choose my uh, Visual C, the correct studio, uh, the correct directory, so the build one from in, in my case. Hit the generate FMU. And we'll see in this case it's going to be rather quick to generate uh, the C code in the FMU. So um, as was mentioned in discussing the FMU standard, um, it packages up XML files as well as compiled C code. This is the C code that was generated for this uh, for this model. And then if I go to my desktop, I can see I now have this controller1.fmu. At this point, I would be able to go into Adam's car, bring in this FMU, and have this controller interacting with my Adam's car model. So this is everything that I had to show from the Maple Maple Stem side. Um, so I'm going to send it back to uh, Kent and Himanth just to wrap up the presentation and um, answer any questions if there are some.